Gentlemen, what is the verdict? Are you innocent? Order! 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 Just tell me what I've heard isn't true. These actions are seditious and amount to treason. In the 19th century, three epic trials changed the course of Australian history. Even if the girl were of bad character, that did not entitle her to be outraged as if she were a beast. In each case, men were on trial for their lives. I knew the men were guilty of murder, but I would never see a white man hanged for killing a black. And in each courtroom, a jury held the future of Australia in its hands. This series is based on actual court reports, which show how the very basis of colonial society was being challenged. It is landowners who generate the wealth in this colony, and I shall do as I damn well see fit! The court's decisions still resonate today. God help you to repent for these crimes. The Mile Creek Massacre took place amongst the peaceful, rolling hills and valleys of the New England Tablelands. It was one of the bloodiest crimes in Australian history. The killers were put on trial in a case which divided Australian society. At stake was the question of whether the Aborigines had the right to protection under the law, or whether they were aliens in their own land. something useful, Anderson. <laughs> Fix us some tucker. <laughs> For God's sake, Anderson, don't tell anyone I went with them. Okay. Boys, tell me what I've heard isn't true. Mr. Robson! Will you report it to Mr. Dengar? Davy. In July 1838, Station Superintendent William Hobbs wrote to Magistrate Denny Day about a massacre in the district. 
Magistrate Day embarked on a rigorous inquiry. After interviewing witnesses and inspecting the site here at Mile Creek, he concluded that a group of stockmen had slaughtered 28 Wirraray men, women and children. They had been decapitated and their bodies burnt in a fire. The case was referred to the new man at Government House, George Gibbs. He was a devout Christian and a humanitarian, and he believed in the Aborigines' right to protection under the law. It's a damn circus out there. Gentlemen, I trust you have your case in order. We'll have this all finished by day's end. Sir, uh, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate our entire case rests on on proving the murder of one Aboriginal man named Daddy with no witnesses and, and, and no body. 28 human beings were murdered here, Mr. Plunkett. I, I understand that, sir, but I think we should be cognizant of the difficulties in proving it. Ah, come now, Plunkett. I really do think we're best off going into this with a bit of positive spirit, old man. Henry Dangar has contributed significant funds to the prisoner's case. You'll have a war with the squatters, and they have the press on their side. I have little time for planters, slave owners, and squatters who want to amass personal fortunes on the backs of the poor. And I care not one jot for popular opinion in this matter. These murderers shall be hanged, as sure as my name is George Gibbs. Uh, Mr. Dagger. Sir. As owner of Mile Creek, perhaps you have a few words for the readers of the Herald? Charles, my good man. Dengar and his fellow squatters had formed a secret society in their fight against the Aborigines over land. And with grim humour, they called it the Black Association. <laughs> the prosecution team was the Attorney General John Plunkett and young barrister Roger Terry. Plunkett knew public opinion was against them. The Sydney Morning Herald had sent their man, Charles Kemp, to report on the proceedings. The Black Association paid for the defence of the Mile Creek killers. They hired top lawyers Charles Windier and lead barrister William Beckett. I wish you all the best, chaps. Always a pleasure to have you in the game. Clark, how do the prisoners wish to plead? Not guilty, Your Honour. Mr. Plunkett, you may proceed with your case for the prosecution. <laughs> Your Honour, gentlemen of the jury, on the 8th or 9th of June, the accused were armed and mounted and scouring the country in pursuit of native blacks. The indictment in this case shows the death of two men. In fact, on the same day and in the same hour, they sacrificed the lives of 28 individuals, men, women, and children. Neither the law of man nor the law of God knows any defense which could justify this atrocious crime. <clears throat> Your Honour, the prosecution moves that a person to the Attorney General unknown did take a certain pistol. And with said pistol, the said person to the Attorney General unknown aforesaid <laughs> did feloniously and willfully, with malice aforethought, discharge and shoot one daddy, an Aboriginal black, and the said person to the Attorney General unknown discharged and shot out the pistol aforesaid, and by force of the gunpowder aforesaid did create one mortal wound, and of which said wound the said daddy then and there instantly died. <laughs> Honourable members of the court, what is one to make of that? 
persons unknown, the said aforesaid. Who is this man unknown to the Attorney General who is said to have shot a man named Daddy? <laughs> where are the witnesses to this incident? Who could swear to it that this man then expired of his wounds on the spot? What this poppycock presented by the prosecution really disguises is the absence of a case. And I can assure you the evidence they present will be vague, circumstantial, and ultimately misleading. Mr. Hobbs, could you state your position, please? I have been superintendent to Mr. Dangar for two years. I had been attending some business on a neighboring station and returned two days later. And how many blacks were on the station when you left? There were about 30 or so. Older men, women, and children. And when you returned, they were no longer present. That's right. I asked Kilmeister what had become of the blacks and told him I had heard they had been murdered. Mr. Hobbs, you saw the place of this murder yourself. Yes, sir. I arrived at a spot where there were a great number of dead bodies. Mr. Hobbs, how many bodies did you count at this alleged murder site? The stench was so great, I was not able to be accurate in counting them. So you could not be sure of the fire's contents if you could not get close to examine it? I saw a body like Daddy's. I knew Daddy. He was the largest man I ever saw, black or white. Could you swear it was Daddy's body? I saw a large body. Its arms and legs were gone. Could you swear to it? I could not swear to it, no. And could you swear that this black is not still in existence? I could not swear that the black called Daddy is no longer in existence, no. Could you swear it was positively male? I could not swear it was male, but it was a large frame. And you were standing away from the fire where these bodies were found. I was. Your Honor, this person, Daddy, seemed to have been shot, cut up, not cut up, stabbed and shot again. How many times was this Daddy killed exactly? If indeed he was ever there at all. <laughs> Mr. Anderson? Mr. Anderson? I was at home when they came with, with knives and pistols. They was talking to Kilmeister. I asked them what they were going to do with the blacks. And they said they were going to take them to the back of the range and frighten them. The oldest of the lot was called Daddy. And Kilmeister went with them? sake, mind what you say. Don't say I went with them. Killmaster went with him and took his pistol with him. I heard two shots over the ridge after about 15 minutes. Is it not true that in your testimonial to Magistrate Day, you were 
unsure of Mr. Kilmeister's movements. No. Uh -huh. In your first statement, you seemed vague about the whole thing. And now you have singled out Mr. Kilmeister for particular grievance. Why is that? You something against the man? No. You've changed your tune to get your liberty, have you not? I never said anything about getting my liberty. I'm here for life. I only asked for protection. I put it to you, sir, that you are a liar. <laughs> Magistrate Day said he would commit me for thinking... Wait, or, not, or not thinking, or... or something. <laughs> After that, I began to recollect more. Have you ever received punishment from Mr. Dangar for dereliction of duty? Well, I had a hundred lashes, but to speak the truth, I did not deserve it. <laughs> Is it not true that when the men left, you demanded they leave you a black woman? I asked them to leave me the gin named to Peter. You asked for a woman to be left, presumably, as some sort of payment. No, it's not like that. I wanted them to leave me margin, to leave a pizza. Your gin? <laughs> <laughs> not, not the one they left me. They, they, they kept saying she was good looking. <laughs> no, no, I didn't say that. I... No, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I can't really recall. You may step down, Mr. Anderson. If it pleases your honor, the defense would like to call a Mr. Henry Dangar to testify to the defendant's good character. <laughs> Mr. Dangar, as owner of the station, how would you consider Mr. Kilmeister's character? Mr. Kilmeister has been in my service since 1834 and has always been a trustworthy and obedient servant. And would you say the same of Mr. Anderson? I would not. I would not believe the man on his oath. He has been very troublesome and uh, on the most trifling occasion is addicted to lying. No reliance could ever be placed on the man and I have punished him more than once. Mr. Dangar, is it true that it was after Mr. Hobbs alerted the magistrate to this heinous occurrence on your property that you had his service terminated? Mr. Hobbs is not under my displeasure on account of this case. His term is up, and therefore so is his service. Are you and Mr. Scott not a uh, subscriber? to a defense fund for these men? I am. I have a faithful servant among them. I believe an honest one and perfectly innocent. I am within my rights to help the man's defense. I always stand by my men. Your Honor, the defense moves that the evidence presented here is completely circumstantial. Not even Mr. Hobbs could swear that the mass of putridity he had seen was male or female. No conviction for murder should take place unless a body has been found, and no proof has been presented that a dead black male had been found, or that a man named Daddy is not in fact still alive somewhere. The case is redundant and should be dismissed before more time is wasted on it. <laughs> Members of the jury, this case is of no ordinary importance to this colony. I am sincerely glad to see prisoners defended by counsel. But a rumor has gone abroad that this defense is made at the instance of an association illegally formed for the purpose of defending all who may be charged with crimes resulting from a clash with the natives. The black is as amenable for his evil acts as the white man, and as much entitled to protection by the law. 
I have too high an opinion of you to think for a moment that any bloody article appearing in any paper would influence you at all in the verdict which you must bring this day. Gentlemen, your deliberations have been most swift. Has the jury reached a verdict in this matter? We have, Your Honor. <clears throat> what is the verdict? We find the prisoners not guilty on yeah! all counts. Prosecution would like to submit further charges and request that the prisoners be held in remand while it's presented. Your Honour, this is all one crime. The prisoners, the prisoners have been found not guilty. They cannot be tried for the same offence. They, they have been acquitted of two murders. But there are 28 separate offences here, Your Honour. Very well. The prisoners shall be remanded in custody whilst the prosecution submits new charges. I also request that the witnesses, Anderson and Hobbs, be put in protective custody. <laughs> Quite a trick you had up your sleeve there, Plunkett. I had nothing up my sleeve, Roger. Dowling has thrown us a rope. The question remains, can we make use of it? The case was sending shockwaves through the colony and abroad. Even Lord Glenelg, the head of the colonial office in London, was quite clear. In his view, the Aborigines were subjects of the Queen, and as such, were entitled to the protection of the law. In Australia, the squatters wanted to force the blacks off the land. To punish their aggressions. At the same time, leading Sydney clergymen were putting the case publicly that the Aborigines had a plain and sacred right to their country. These robbers! At stake was the legitimacy of white settlement. I knew the men were guilty of murder, but I would never see a white man hanged for killing a black. What next, Mr. Plunkett? We feel we should concentrate on the killing of a child. A name Charlie. Yes, the boy was a favourite of Mr. Hobbs. Our problem now is that Anderson has been painted as unreliable. Well, what about this Davy fellow, the Aboriginal witness? Your Excellency, the Aborigine does not believe in God or have any fixed belief in a future state of rewards and punishments. He is therefore incapable of taking an oath, which is contrary to the fundamental principle of British law. Well, so is discrediting witnesses and pressuring jurymen. I just don't see how we can use Davy as a witness. Then find another. There is no other. Well, what happens now? I shall lead the case from here on. And you will split those prisoners. Or... We'll have nothing at all. Mr. Russell, the bench would look favorably on a prisoner who changed his testimony due to his conscience. It is an admirable quality. Not where I come from. The Aborigines. Ah, murderous wretches. The Aborigines are murderous wretches. 
And while a white man is sent to trial, perhaps for his life, the savages who provoke these aggressions by plunder and probably by murder flee for the wilds and defy all attempts at capture. But the Herald did not speak for the whole of Sydney. Settlers who supported the Aborigines were finding their voice. The Australian newspaper was disgusted by this butchery. The interests of humanity, it wrote, the character of the colony and the honour of the British name are outraged. Whoever be the perpetrator, the murder is most foul and unnatural. The Australian was leading public opinion in favour of the Aborigines. But the Black Association and the Herald were relentless in their campaign against the Blacks. This is insane. Can't we fight it their way? To Tudangar, what they did to our witnesses. We're men of the law, Roger. We should argue by the law, not pander to sensationalism. I need more from Hobson Anderson. That puffed up Ponce Terry said if I turn, the court would reward me for it. All I can say, lads, is that it's a fine thing when a man can hold his head high for what he believes in. I'm proud of you for sticking together. You can't be tried for the same crime. I have no doubt the case will be thrown out. Then why are we still locked up in this godforsaken place then? I'll take my leave of you then, gentlemen. That's a fair point. If there's no case to answer, why are we here? What if the Crown has some bloody legal trickery to keep this thing going? We have some trickery too. We need your testimony to, to rise above that of Dengar's. You need to show them you're men of substance. I'll tell you everything you need to say on the stand. Just follow it. I've got transportation for doing what another man told me. It won't happen again. George, I need you to be steady. Can you do that? There's a code, Mr. Plunky. Oh, you know, Mr. Hobbs, when you wrote that letter, you knew what they'd do to you. But should that code be above the law? Answer me, Anderson. Is that code above the law? I don't understand why Kilmaster went. The men made him. He went of his own will. And in any case, if you protect him, the others go free. Well, if you say so. I do say so. No. Can you both stand firm? Anderson and Hobbs will return to the stand. Did we find another witness? There is only Davy, the Aboriginal. He does claim to have seen the whole thing. But you say he can't swear on oath. We could try it. Are these all the prisoners now arraigned for the case? They are, Your Honor. And who is to confirm them? Mr. Hobbs, Your Honor. Mr. Hobbs, you can confirm that these are the men stated on the charge sheet? I can, Your Honor. You may go. As preparations for the second trial got underway, Judge William Burton took over from Dowling. Mr. Hobbs? Yes, sir. What on earth? Take your hands off me, sir! Explain yourself, sir! What in God's name is going on? I'm arresting this man for non-payment of debts. You'll do no such thing. Who is his accuser? Experience, it is not uncommon practice to find witnesses unexpectedly under arrest as of a corrupt desire to hinder public justice. The prisoner shall be committed to stand trial for the charges presented. 
Your Honour, I request an adjournment period for the... I concur, Your Honour. And in light of the continued interferences in the court, I would draw attention to the reports in the Herald in the last weeks containing material liable to pervert the course of justice. And I welcome the defence's adjournment to make an injunction against the newspaper so it can no longer influence the progress of the trial. Granted. You won't get away with what you're doing. I have no idea what you could mean. If this colony is nothing more than a corrupt network of monopolies, secret handshakes, there is no hope for it. But Mr. Plunkett, are you suggesting I am somehow engaged in some reprehensible activity to affect the outcome of this case? I am a man of considerable standing, sir. I would advise against any intention you may have to tarnish my good name in public. Did you get hold of Davy? Shall we try it one more time? If there is one God... Mr. Plunkett, I hardly think that is a matter in question. When you have a chief in your tribe, he is the most powerful man, yes? And as the most powerful man, you hold him in the most respect. Your chief is the closest authority to God. The Queen has authority over this land, and so over your chiefs. But the highest chief in the land is the highest authority, and even closer to the authority of God. So, by repeating this statement of allegiance to the Queen and to God, you are saying that what you tell is the truth. And if it is not, you will be punished for it. Forever. You'll be punished for eternity, Blanket. Do you understand, Devi? There. We have it! <laughs> it won't do. He only has to convince the court for a few minutes. He has to believe it, Mr. Terry. If we allow him to swear without belief, it undermines everything we stand for. It undermines our purpose here. Repeating the words is not enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Black Association continued funding the defence lawyers. <laughs> because the squatters knew what was at stake here. Settlers who took on the Aborigines could be painted as murderers or as heroes blazing a trail for empire. One jury had already sided with the squatters. All right. And there was every chance that would happen again. Gibson Plunkett were determined to see justice done according to the law. But the Black Association was playing by different rules. the jury be exactly clearly we can't allow the trial to continue without a jury or we can swear in a jury from the courthouse your honor really i don't think fine mr plunkett if you'd be so kind <laughs> Dangar's tactics. Four hours later, Plunkett did gather a jury from around the court. Order! Mr. Plunkett, 
We have a jury. We do, Your Honor. The prosecution moves that with the prisoner Kilmeister at their head, these men before you did all aid and abet an unknown person to shoot and stab a black Aboriginal child named Charlie, severing its head in the process. These men all joined in kicking and beating the child and then threw it into a fire where they let it remain and be until it died. The defense arguments go thus far. Twelve murders might be committed and the same parties being tried and acquitted for one cannot be tried for another. <laughs> they laugh, but in this case there are 28 or about that number. And because although the prisoners at the bar have been acquitted in one case, they ought to be tried again in another. But I say, whether it be 28 or 58 murders being committed, each one of those murders is a separate crime, even though not one of the names of the parties murdered be known. Oh, come, come, sir. New circumstances have arisen, which will prove that the prisoner Kilmeister was actuated by malice, and that there is enough evidence to confirm the identity of the boy Charlie, the murder of whom these prisoners now stand charged. Yes, I recall the children at the station. There were a dozen to fifteen of them. In particular, I remember young Charlie, a very familiar, very forward and knowing child, the most remarkable child of the lot. And you saw the, the heads and limbs of, of children quite distinctly in the fire? Quite distinct. I would swear they were eight or ten or twelve. And had the sight changed in appearance on the second visit with Mr. Foster? It was diminished, probably by native dogs. Might there have been some other cause for this diminishment? Someone might have removed anything without my knowing. Could it conceivably have been Kilmeister? In a panic after hearing that you intended to report the matter, sneaking up to the site at night and removing the bodies, hadn't Kilmeister begged you not to report the incident? He asked me not to report it to Mr. Dangar, yes. I must dispute this line of questioning, Your Honor. In previous testimony, Mr. Hobbs, you claimed the site was exactly the same on the second visit. Well, no. No, I mean, what I meant was they were in the same deplorable condition, that's all. You inspected them minutely. Yes, I... Even though you testified that you were standing away from the fire. I inspected it. You may step down, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Anderson. You say the little boy known as Charlie came up to about your navel? That's correct, yes. Yet we have another account that states he was considerably larger. And at one point you have stated that there were in fact two Charlies. Well, there, there was one bigger than the other, but, but that one was never actually led away. What I mean is, 
I, I didn't see him there for sure because the blacks were all in, in a lump together. Well, how did he go there, Mr. Anderson? Eh? How did he go? Did he walk? Was he carried? In fact, the boy may well have remained in the hut and gone out the back. Did you see him walking? You're twisting my words around, Mr. Beckett. You know what I'm saying. Did you see him walking, Mr. No, Anderson? I did not see him walking, Mr. Beckett. But I'm sure he went with him. I am sure of that, sir. Although you did not physically see the boy Charlie and the tight group tied together, are you sure he was taken away? Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Charlie was in the hut and then afterwards he'd gone away. I mean, he could only have gone with him, sir. That's the only place he could have gone. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Your Honor, the defense wishes to propose that, frankly, there has been no evidence presented by the Crown for the murder of a Charlie to which the jury might confine itself. Indeed, there has not even been a probability that has so far been put to it. As far as anyone knows, this person may still be alive, roving through the hills and dales. The only person to have made reference to him, Anderson, could not even be certain that person had been taken away with the others. I suggest the court dismiss the case. There are so many reasonable hypotheses as to what might have occurred, including the possibility that the said party may have gone off and simply been attacked by another party of marauding blacks and left in the way described. Simply because these men, the prisoners, happened to be in the company of that party some time before does not lead to the conclusion that they are murderers. No. No. Yes, we believe there is a case to be heard by jury here. Yes. I would bid Mr. Plunkett continue with his next witness. Mr. Plunkett. We have to take Tangar now. Mr. Plunkett. Your Honor, the prosecution would like to call Mr. Henry Dangar. Very late, Your Honor. Is this likely to continue much longer? Mr. Dangar, I recall you commenting that you, you always stand by your men. Mr. Anderson is, is one of your men, but you, you seem to be at pains to undermine him in this court. Mr. Dangar, have you ever witnessed Mr. Anderson take an oath? I have not. But I would not believe him regardless on account of his bad character and the countless lies he has told. You also seem to be at pains to discredit the claims of Mr. Hobbs, another of your men, that the blacks were killed on your station. I did not discredit him, sir, but I thought it strange that a man could not count to 28. <laughs> would you dismiss a servant for shooting a black? On my oath, I would, yes. So why did you dismiss Mr. Hobbs instead of Mr. Kilmeister? Your Honor, this is a base implication and I move it be rejected. Why did you dismiss Mr. Hobbs? As I had previously explained to this court, Mr. Hobbs' service had expired. So it uh, wasn't a dismissal over his failure to prevent the blacks on your property 
from coming to harm. Mr. Denga, are you obliged to reply to the question? I had already made up my mind not to rehire Hobbs before the incident took place, but I hadn't told him yet. And yet, you, you told Magistrate Day you were well pleased with Mr. Hobbs. I did. And Mr. Hobbs' subsequent actions had no influence on your decision to parse with him? No, they did not. Indeed. Well, surely there, there must be grounds for the failure to renew the contract of a, a good employee with an unblemished record. It would be tantamount to dismissal. It would leave a stain on a man's character. You are evidently a man who firmly believes in character as a signal of a person's uh, reliability and trustworthiness. I am, yes. Is it not true that you yourself were dismissed from a government position following the uh, investigation into land appropriation when you were a land surveyor? Grave allegations of impropriety, I believe. Your Honour, Your Honour, this witness is not on trial. No. I believe it to be a pertinent question. Mr. Danga. I believe I was once suspended from a public office, but um, it was a small matter and I've heard no more about it. Were well, you not dismissed, sir? I was suspended. Mr. Danga, I would ask you not to equivocate in your response to the question. Sir, I ask you again. A... Suspension could be construed as tantamount to a dismissal, I suppose, and I was told that. Is it also true that after your suspension, a notice was issued that you were not to be reinstated? Perhaps the Secretary of State had issued something or other, but it was all a long time ago. Answer the question. Were you not dismissed for misappropriation of land titles? I believe some regarded that to be the case. Were you present during the interim hearing? I was about the court, yes. Of course, you had a vested interest. I must object to this, Your Honour. I ask because there is a strange occurrence involving Mr. Hobbs being erroneously arrested for debt after giving evidence. Were you aware of this? Well, I believe somebody mentioned something, but uh, I had no prior knowledge of it. Could you also be aware of the want of jurymen? for the hearing this morning. Are you suggesting I may have had a hand in these matters? You are observed discouraging potential members of the gallery to sit it out. I swear I did no such thing. Mr. Dangar, what would be your reasons for defraying the expenses of the prisoners? I believe we've been here before, Your Honor. I have every right to support whomever I choose, should I so choose. But no such money to support Mr. Anderson, Mr. Hobbs, both in your employ. Anderson is a disreputable liar and a scoundrel, and as for Hobbs, I've already wasted enough time and money on the man. It is landowners who generate the wealth in this colony, and I shall do as I damn well see fit! Thank you, Mr. Dangar. Gentlemen of the jury, in the first instance, I would direct you to apply your minds to the matter of the boy, Charlie, alone. But should you not find a case for murder, you must turn your attention to the counts relating to the various unknown children. It is quite clear that the testimony of Mr. Anderson, a principal witness, has been impeached from some frivolous cause by Henry Dangar. We have heard his estimation of Mr. Anderson's character and credibility, and also heard circumstances relative to the misappropriation of land. We have also seen the manner in which Mr. Dangar conducted himself in the box. 
Mr. Dengar, who appears in no very creditable situation before the court, is evidently biased in his whole conduct. His subscription to the defense of these men may well be a charitable act, or it may be something far worse. But when a person who knows nothing as to the facts of the case, either for or against the prisoners, comes forward to impeach the evidence of principal witnesses, circumstances may come out to throw a doubt on the evidence of that person himself. It is clear that a human creature has been slain. And I hope there is no need for me to state that it makes no difference in the sight of God or the law whether that creature has a white or a black skin, for they are both equally liable to the protection of the law. I have stated what you have to decide on, and I now leave the case to you. Later. What is your verdict? Your Honor, we find the defendants not guilty. <laughs> Your Honor, Mr. Sewell has made a mistake, sir. The jury has found the defendants not guilty on the other counts. But we find the prisoners guilty of the murder of an Aboriginal child whose name is to the Attorney General unknown. We were acquitted. We were acquitted. The case of the Queen against Kilmeister was done. And just after 9am on Tuesday the 18th of December, seven men paid a terrible price for their acts of savagery on the colonial frontier. It was the first time white men were hanged for murdering Aborigines. <laughs> Places where the law could not breach, there were still whites who used guns or poison to kill off the blacks. The men who committed these crimes no longer boasted about them in public, but they continued. George Anderson got no special favours for his role in the trial. He waited another eight years for a conditional pardon. William Hobbs was blacklisted by the squatters 
and spent his few remaining years living in hunger and fear. Gibbs remained Governor of New South Wales for another eight years. He wanted to save the Aborigines. He wanted to control the squatters' hunger for land. But the colony needed revenue, and the squatting runs were great engines of wealth. Gibbs returned home to England a broken man. He died of a heart attack eight months later, aged 56. After lying low to avoid controversy, Henry Danga went on to acquire more land. He grew rich and powerful. Today, Danga Island is named in his honour, as are parks and streets across the map of New South Wales. We don't know what happened to Davy. Unable to give evidence in the white man's court, he bore silent witness to it all. But the story of Mile Creek has never been forgotten by the people of this region. Today, this monument is maintained by Aboriginal and white Australians. It has become part of the story, the shared story of this country.